is a small gift from us. A Thank you. Which you can open later. Well, after this embarrassing introduction by uh, <laughs> Professor Bobescu, again, my name is Dimitrios uh, Christodoulidis. I'm from the College of Optics and Photonics of the University of Central Florida. And as you can tell from the title of my talk, today I will be discussing some of our recent work on parallel time and other symmetries in optics. Uh, I would like to thank again uh, Professor Bobescu for inviting me to uh, Urbana. This is my first time over here, and uh, I must say I'm extremely impressed with your campus. Uh, before I uh, proceed, let me say a few things about my college. Uh, Creole, the College of Optics and Photonics, is uh, situated in Orlando, Florida. It's one of the uh, three uh, colleges dedicated to optics together with Arizona and, and, and Rochester. And there is quite a, a bit of portfolio of activities, anywhere from uh, nano lasers to high power lasers. Uh, we're trying to expand a bit more in biophotonics. And of course, uh, most of our activities cater to the Department of Defense. Uh, to some extent, one may consider us to be a subcontractor of DOD. <laughs> so, Having said that, let me try to put my talk in perspective. So in, in the last few years, there has been considerable activity in developing new optical structures and materials. So back in the 90s, we have seen the emergence of photonic crystals. These are dielectric structures that so happen to be periodic. And of course, because of the periodicity, uh, one can identify over here uh, band gaps, bands, and so on, very much so, like in solid state physics. And we, in the mid-90s, we have seen the emergence of photonic crystal fibers. This so happened to be the cousins, the two-dimensional cousins of, of these systems. Uh, and photonic crystal fibers today are enjoying, you know, they, uh, they are used in a variety of applications, in particular in conjunction with nonlinear uh, optics. Plasmonics is another area that is very, very active uh, today, and the whole idea is to really uh, 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 benefit from sort of interactions between uh, photonics, uh, photons and uh, metals for the matter, plasmonics. And of course, we have seen the emergence of negative index materials. Uh, these are meant to be uh, systems that exhibit negative refractive index uh, for the matter. So if you want to really take an overview of these activities in the past few years, one can summarize them in this uh, diagram over here in, uh, on this axis. So if I plot here the permeability of a material and on this axis the permittivity of a material, clearly if mu and epsilon so happen to be positive, we are dealing with normal materials uh, like glass, silicon, and so on and so forth. If by any chance I invert epsilon, in other words, make epsilon to be negative while keeping mu to be um, mu sub zero, for example, or positive, then I enter the plasmonic regime. Uh, I may be able to invert both parameters, both epsilon and mu, in which case I get into the negative index, uh, uh, say, domain. And of course, there is always this particular possibility over here. Of course, I have to say that every time you change radically the permittivity of a material, and this is typically accomplished by introducing metallic inclusions, metal metals, uh, by nature very, very lossy, especially when it comes to the optical frequencies. So it's a drastic thing. Whenever you enter these particular uh, domains over here, you are actually relying on, on something quite drastic like introducing metallic inclusions and so on and so forth. So a few years back, uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, together with my colleagues, we decided to explore a somewhat different uh, avenue. So as opposed to really force, uh, forcing the permeability to change sign, let's keep it as God intended in, in a, uh, a, a particular material system. Uh, and don't really mess up too much with the real uh, part of the uh, permittivity, but is ex uh, instead expand your game uh, along the imaginary part of the permittivity. So essentially take the problem from the real domain into the complex domain. So, of course, if this parameter here is positive, we are dealing with gain. If this is negative, we are dealing with loss. So the question is, what can one do if we start really uh, 
uh, expanding uh, our activities in the complex domain. So every time you design an optical system, you rely on three basic parameters. The refractive index, and of course this is what you always do when you want to build a cavity, when you want to build a waveguide, the photonic crystal, and so on. And of course, the imaginary components that I mentioned before may lead to gain, amplification for the matter, and amplification is by all means a valuable commodity, meaning we need gain to overcome losses, we need gain to induce nonlinear effects, and so on and so forth. Loss, on the other hand, meaning if we have optical loss, uh, this is abundant in nature. You don't have to look far, uh, you know. And of course, for an optical engineer or anyone working in optics, this is considered to be a problem. So we always shy away from it. We always try to avoid loss as much as we can. So it is no surprise that in the last few years, we actually mostly extended our activities along this ridge and always try to avoid this part. So the issue is, what can I do if I mix this, uh, uh, you know, these three items together uh, in the same courtroom? Can I get, for example, new functionalities, new behavior, as long as I can mix appropriately, really, these uh, three ingredients? So the question you have to ask is, is, is loss always a problem? Well, there are many, many situations over here that if you, for example, if I have a cavity with gain, optical gain, if I surround it with lossy uh, systems, there are many occasions that as I increase the loss, the system actually performs better. So it, it looks counterintuitive uh, that the system uh, lasers better the time you are providing loss. And of course, uh, what justifies this uh, peculiar behavior is the very fact that whenever you are dealing really with s complex systems, whenever you are dealing with complex numbers, you never know where exactly on the complex domain your complex eigenvalue will land. So it has a lot of flexibility for that matter. So it, it's hard to tell how the system will overall behave just because you are looking really superficially the content of gain and loss in the system. Of course, if you're going to be using, uh, say, uh, gain, you have to use it in a very clever way. You can't just sprinkle it and hope for the best. But if you use it in a strategic manner, it will help several areas, anywhere from nanolasers to metamaterials, plasmonics, and, and, and so on and so forth. But how do you, can you use it in a strategic way that it doesn't really promote spurious modes? Interestingly enough, one, uh, you know, Part of the answer comes from, a, uh, you know, from an unexpected place, namely from quantum field theory. You see, back in the uh, late 90s, Carl Bender asked a very interesting question. Should a Hamiltonian be her mission in order to exhibit real eigenvalues? Of course, any one of you who took elementary course in quantum mechanics, he will associate her, you know, real eigenvalues with her mission operators. It turns out, however, that it's a very, a very large class of, Ham of, of uh, Hamiltonians that are not Hermitian. Instead, they respect parity time symmetry that so happen to have real spectra. So, um, how this occurs? Well, what do I mean by parity time symmetry? So these are Hamiltonians that commute the parity time operator. And of course, you have to really put this in terms of operator algebra. So the parity operator always flips the position x to minus x and of course the momentum. The time reversal operator, meanwhile, flips the time. And of course, in, the, uh, in a Schrodinger formalist, it takes i to minus i and so the momentum. So it takes a few lines to show that a Hamiltonian that is shown over here uh, with a complex potential V so happens to respect parity time symmetry as long as the complex potential satisfies this condition. The conjugate of V must be equal to V minus X. So if that's the case, and this is a necessary, not sufficient condition, then there is a good possibility that the spectrum of this operator will be entirely real. So, of course, from here, one can deduce in few lines that the real part of this potential must be an even fractional position, 
while the imaginary part describing gain and loss must be anti-symmetric. And as I said, this is necessary, it's not sufficient. In other words, maybe you can, as you'll see, occasionally we may have this condition, but even then, the spectrum may run into the complex domain. But in any event, so once you introduce, of course, parity time symmetry, then you have to do things uh, right from the very beginning. You see, part of the issue is how you define a bra for a given cat, how you define orthogonality. So you see, in standard quantum mechanics, in Hermitian quantum mechanics, this is the way you get the inner product. You conjugate really the other eigenvector, and then this will give you a Kronegger delta. And of course, you recognize this, anyone who took an elementary course in quantum mechanics, uh, as the conservation of probability. On the other hand, in PT symmetric systems, the orthogonality, to establish orthogonality, you have to flip really the x in the bra. And, and in addition, as opposed to this big conserved, you have an anti-probability that remains invariant. This is no longer invariant. So what I'm trying to say is, once you go into this domain, you have to introduce a new algebra because of this bi new biorthogonal vector. So just to get a glimpse of what I'm talking about, let me consider this potential over here. Let's say minus ix raised to n. N can be any power. It can be fractional, it can be an integer, it doesn't matter. But it takes only a few lines to show that this potential obeys the condition I uh, you know, mentioned before. V star of x must be V minus x. So if n is 2, for example, then of course V becomes x square, and then this potential here is, your it is a potential that corresponds to your familiar quantum harmonic oscillator. The solutions are all bound states over here, correspond to bound states. Here is the ground state, sec first mode, second mode, third mode, and so on, equidistantly display. And of course, you, you know, these modes, all these states really have nodes as expected. But what happens, for, and of, uh, and of, what happens now if n is 3? If n is 3, v is ix cube, okay? So it has, it's purely imaginary. Uh, it goes with the cubic power that's shown over here. Yet, if you solve this particular problem, you're going to find, to your surprise, that all the states are bound states. And all the eigenvalues so happen to be real, in spite of the very fact that you have an eye sticking out. Of course, if I ever tell you that this potential here supports bound states, you'll believe me, because after all, it's concave upwards, right? But if I tell you that x cubed, this is an x cubed function, it has no local minimum, uh, only supports bound states, uh, that's surprising. Of course, it's the I that actually helps the whole idea. So this is some kind of pseudo-Hermitian quantum harmonic oscillator, as good as this one, right, for the matter. However, there is a huge difference. You see the nodes, the zero nodes have disappeared. So from the first mode to the second to the third, and then in addition, the modes are no longer orthogonal. Instead, they so happen to be skewed. And this has important ramifications, really, in the discussion that we're going to be having very, very soon. So, however you look at quantum mechanics is Hermitian theory. There is no way it's, not gonna be, it's gonna be not Hermitian or PT symmetric or anything of that sort. The physics has totally stuck against the proposition, uh, you know, proposed before. However, Nothing stops, me, uh, nothing stops us from really using uh, these aspects in, in classical optics, in optics in general. In, uh, I can always get a, an index distribution uh, because the refractive index, if you think about it, in optics plays the role of a potential. I can always use an index distribution that so happens to be even, impregnated halfway with gain and the other half with loss. So I establish PT symmetry and this is what we did in few papers back in 2008. And if you have such a, a, a waveguide, half filled with gain and one with loss, you get a nice symmetric mode that neither uh, uh, gets amplified or decays. And of course you may say, what's the big deal here? Meaning you've got a waveguide, you put half gain, half loss. Okay, you balance uh, the losses with gain. Well, there is something more sinister going on over here. Well, you see, this structure, this mode, is sustained 
because of a cost and energy flow between, in essence, we are dealing with a dipole, right? And because of that, you know, what happens is the following. Let me, to understand what I mean, let me terminate the standard waveguide, uh, uh, you know, on an air interface. You, the wavefronts in the standard waveguide so happen to be perpendicular to the direction of propagation. As, as, so as it goes out, the diffraction so happens to be symmetric. On the other hand, if this is pretty symmetric, you will find very soon that the wavefronts are slanted in this particular way because of that energy flow from gain to loss regions I was telling you before. And this is not because it's birefringent. It's because of these gain-loss dipoles you are using over there. So essentially the wavefronts being slanted leads to a diffraction pattern that actually moves in this particular direction. So, okay, so if that's the case, then if I'm gonna have a pretty symmetric waveguide, the only way I can excite it will be to go at an angle so as I slant really the wavefronts. And of course I will go from here, go upwards, go out that way. Of course, you may ask what will happen if I try to come backwards? Well, there is an issue here. You see, as I was going up, the gain was on my left, the loss was on my right. If I come down, it's the other way around. So if I want to replicate this, I cannot come backwards. I have to come from this direction here. Only this way I can replicate this experiment. So all these gain-loss dipoles are actually breaking the, uh, the symmetry in the, in the particular system. Central to the discussion that I'm gonna be uh, providing over here is the presence of what we call a exceptional points. Exceptional points happen to be degeneracies in the, you know, for no Hermitian systems. And to exemplify them, perhaps I should give you a, a trivial example. So, uh, well, to begin with, whenever you have a degeneracy in a Hermitian system, Typically, the two cones, the eigenvalue cones, tend to really uh, meet each other uh, at, the, you know, at, the, uh, at one point where the degeneracy occurs, uh, occasionally called diabolic point, okay? This is what you see in, in Hermitian systems like in quantum mechanics. However, in non-Hermitian systems, these degeneracies are, we are shown over here are coming in a very interesting way in the sense that the Riemann sheets are actually perplexing each other. And this has important ramifications in the discussions we're gonna be discussing later on, you know, in the discussion we're gonna be having later on. So let me consider, for example, uh, you know, two cavities, uh, like the ones uh, Ken is, uh, you know, working on these days, right? One would gain, one would loss, coupled together, right? You can very easily write the couple mode equations for these systems. It can be two waveguides for that matter, one pump, the other one kept at, 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 lost, in, at, at lost. So the differential equations that describe this system, it cannot be, uh, you know, as shown over here. This system will uh, exhibit, say, uh, gain, this one's uh, loss, and kappa describes the uh, coupling parameter, the exchange uh, between the two uh, subsystems you can very quickly get the eigenvectors. Meaning all you have to do is a bit of linear algebra, right? And identify really the two eigenvectors for this two by two system. It so happens that the first eigenvector is given by this column vector, where theta happens to be in the inverse sine of G, which is the gain loss contrast of a kappa, right? And the second, uh, say, uh, eigenvector is given by this column vector. If by any chance there is no gain, no loss, theta is zero, and then this reduces to your familiar, uh, uh, you know, states, one, one, one minus one, as you know, which so happen to be orthogonal. But if, as you increase the gain or loss over here, then at some point theta goes to pi over two. And at that point, see what happens. This is gonna become one i, and this will become again one i. So essentially at that point, what happens is not only your eigen, and look what happens over here, your two eigenvalues remain really real as long as g over two kappa is below unity. But at that magic point, at the exceptional point, the two eigenvalues coalesce, 
but even more importantly, the two eigenvectors collapse on each other. So what happens over here is very simple. You used to have a two-dimensional vector space, and then all of a sudden, at that point, it becomes one-dimensional. It's a pretty drastic event. Once you pass now, so this is a classic case of a pithy symmetry where uh, the two eigenvalues remain uh, real as long as you are below that threshold. But once you pass that threshold, right, the two eigenvalues turn into imaginary, purely imaginary. And then, as a result, you're going to find out that one of the eigenvectors enjoys amplification, the other one decays. And even more importantly, you're going to find out that it's always a pi over a pi two difference between the two components. So we start from a Hermitian system where the two eigenvectors are orthogonal, as you expect. And then you start increasing the gain-loss contrast. And at the exceptional point, the two collapse on each other. And then eventually, they depart as you pass the exceptional point and you enter the broken phase regime, as they call it. So uh, as this is now provides a bifurcation, right, in the eigenvalues from real to imaginary. And this marks the presence of the exceptional point. But this, as I said, look at the bifurcation. It's a very strong bifurcation. And, and this is something we're going to be using later on. Now, is this unique to discrete systems like the one I uh, described before? The answer is no. Meaning you can have waveguides uh, have impregnated with gain and loss, and you're going to get exactly the same behavior of eigenvalues, irrespective of the fact that the system is continuous. So first uh, time we were able really to put our hands on such effects was back in 2009, where we tested really a, a couple system of two planar waveguides. Uh, that in principle, uh, if you put light here, they start exchanging power back and forth because they're coupled. But then we provided on purpose lots of losses on the top of this waveguide over here. You tend to think that as I increase the loss, right, light will actually decay in this waveguide because it goes back and forth really in these lossy domains. But this is not happens. This is true only up to a certain point. You see here we provide a lot of loss, by the way, 13 centimeters of loss, 40, these are huge numbers. So you can tell up to 18 centimeters, this is what happens. We get an exponential decay. Then we overdo it with loss, and as opposed to really kill it, the system now starts to become transparent. Why this happens is because the system thinks that it's in the broken regime and allows one supermode really to go through. We got very similar results, uh, even when we provide gain and loss in uh, uh, experiments we've done in the past in lithium niobate using two-wave mixing. Now, how about if we are dealing with periodic structures? Well, if you have, uh, say, a periodic structure like this, right, then you expect, because of the Floguet block theorem, to have a series of bands, uh, band gaps, and so on and so forth. This is what we expect in the lossless case. But if by any chance now you impregnate every, you know, every cell with gain and loss, you know, with equal amounts of gain and loss, then the two bands start to really, you know, start, as you increase the gain-loss contrast, the two bands start to approach each other. And then eventually at the, you know, uh, at a certain level, they start touching each other. So they merge. And then if you overdo it, then your two bands now take this shape. On this oval, the eigenvalues so happen to be real. On, on these uh, edges over here, on these wings, the eigenvalues so happen to be complex. So you have totally destroyed or modified the band structure because you went into the non-Hermitian domain. Even more importantly, the eigenfunctions are skewed again. All the Floguet uh, block uh, modes, again, happen to be skewed. So you can get all sorts of interesting effects. Uh, you can get double refraction even though your system is fully isotropic because of this gain-loss dipoles. You can get power oscillations, things you can never get really in uh, Hermitian arrangement. Now in 2D, of course, this is the band structure you expect. And as you increase the uh, gain-loss contrast, of course, the two will collapse on each other and form this uh, oval surface over here. It looks like a Chinese uh, cookie. 
with the two membranes sur surrounded by two membranes upon which the eigenvalues are complex. And even though this we published these results back in 2008, in 2015, this very interesting effect of band merging was observed by uh, the MIT group of uh, uh, Joan Nobulos uh, and Soljasic, uh, where instead of really having an exceptional point, now they're dealing with an exceptional line uh, for that matter. So how about something else? Uh, let's say I have a Bragg grading. So let's say I have a Bragg grading and I put have gain, have loss in every period of the Bragg grading. Of course, if I don't do that, and you analyze any Bragg grading, you're going to find a region of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, um, you're going to find that the transmission is zero at the Bragg frequency. Everything gets reflected, right? But as I increase, however, the gain-loss contrast, something happens. Uh, this one here uh, starts to really narrow, but even more importantly, the Bragg reflection that used to be 100% starts to really subside. And if I reach the exceptional point, then everything goes through, right? And the reflection is zero. And this is a broadband phenomenon. In other words, you have totally killed the Bragg grading. You have totally killed the Bragg reflection simply because you took the system in the complex domain. So, and not only that, the grading doesn't leave any imprint in terms of phase. It's like it doesn't exist. It's like it totally disappeared. Now, you have to understand, when I entered this Bragg grading, I went from gain to loss. So the question is, what happens if I come the other way around? If I, come, if I step in loss gain as opposed to gain loss? So if you do that, not only doesn't disappear, but look, the reflectivity now it gets so amplified. So if I come from this particular direction, the grading disappears. From this particular, you know, from the right direction, the system is absolutely visible. So uh, this effect was first observed by, uh, in collaboration with Max Planck and us uh, a few years back. Uh, so we emulated these mesh lattices, and you can see, you see in the passive system, we see still reflections. If we go, uh, if we bring it to uh, a PT symmetry at the exceptional point, everything goes through, no reflections, whereas if you go from the other side, it's totally visible for that matter. Uh, soon after uh, our results, um, uh, the, uh, this was demonstrated uh, in um, uh, silicon nanowave guides uh, by Caltech and later on by uh, Zhang's group at Berkeley, uh, where they were able really to see two different, uh, say, response, depending on how you have really stuck uh, the losses in the system. Um, at the same time, there was, uh, you know, the Zhang's group was able to use this particular effect in order to enforce single mode behavior in, in system of this sort, where chromium and germanium are actually but, you know, providing the necessary periodic losses uh, uh, along micro rings. So, uh, soon after there has been considerable work in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, observing PT symmetry in micro cavities, couple cavities, one, you know, that may evolve, one may be lossy, one, uh, you know, be pumped uh, for that matter. So like the work uh, done by Young's group uh, back in 2014, where for the first time we can see in the spectral domain you know, these bifurcations as predicted by theory. Um, similar results were reported by Nanjing and many other groups uh, since then. So um, we have seen, uh, for example, uh, issues like this. You may actually increase the loss and indeed lazy may subside and then you over increase it and then lazy comes back. This is what I was telling you before. And similar results have been observed from Austria uh, in uh, uh, quantum cascade laser. So this, uh, our take, this work was done in, in Mercedes Hajabikan's group over at Creole in, in our institution, where she paired two microring lasers in this particular manner. Uh, the diameter of each one of them is 10 microns. One of them is palm, so as to exhibit gain. The other one is lossy. 
One of the problems that we face always with micro rings is that it's very difficult really to make them lace in one wavelength. They typically lace in several uh, longitudinal wavelengths. And whenever you try really to play the standard tricks we, uh, we use in, uh, in cavities, they don't particularly work in such, uh, you know, small scales. So it's very difficult to use, say, gradings or any other selective elements really to get the, uh, say, the longitudinal mode out. However, it so happens that if I take this active, uh, uh, say, cavity and I pair it with an identical but lossy partner, then I bring them in PT symmetry, and then once the PT symmetry is broken, then the longitudinal mode that ex exhibits a bit of higher gain than the rest just shoots out, totally discriminating uh, that longitudinal mode from the rest. Why this is the case is because of that square root behavior I was telling you before. It totally magnifies the contrast of gain and then allows really the, uh, the mode to lace, in a, uh, the laser to uh, oscillate in, in one frequency. So uh, this is typically how it's made. We are uh, actually fabricating these uh, systems. This is how they look under uh, SEM. And of course, the results are summarized over here. You see, if I pump only one ring, you get a forest of longitudinal modes. If I pump them both, Again, we get doublets. Each one of them splits in two, right? Uh, so this is not good either. Then if we bring them in PT symmetry, everything is thrown out, and the only, there is only one mode that actually is encouraged really to, uh, um, to lace. So uh, PT symmetry, in other words, can be used to really enforce single mode behavior uh, in this particular uh, arrangement. The next aspect I would like to bring is using exceptional points for sensing. You see, exceptional point being a degeneracy, not Hermitian degeneracy. Whenever you bring a system uh, over there, it is like you have set up a, something like a mousetrap. It's a point that contains a lot of energy. And with the first opportunity, with the first perturbation, tends to explode. Why that is? And of course, uh, he, in the previous example, I gave you uh, a system where all two eigenvectors uh, so happen to be collapsing on each other. And we say we had an exceptional point of order two. But there are many, you know, there are systems over there where you can collapse three eigenvectors on one, in which case we have an exceptional point of three, four eigenvectors on, uh, uh, on each one of them. So these are stand, you know, arrangements we found that you can get up to exceptional points up to 10 if you have a photonic molecule. So what does this mean? To understand this, let's go back to a Hermitian system. If I perturb the system to order epsilon, then you understand the perturbation is going to show up as order epsilon. This is what we know. So if I change the refractive index in a cavity in the six decimal digit, the change in the, uh, say, uh, resonant frequency will be in the six decimal digit, right? This is what we know from quantum mechanics. This is what we know from uh, the systems, the emission systems. However, if I place a, a system at an exceptional point, this no longer is valid. Instead, the first order that shows up is epsilon one over n. If you are dealing with an exceptional point of order two, then this will be a square root of epsilon. If you are dealing with an exceptional point of order three, that will be the cubic root of epsilon. So if say, for example, epsilon is 10 to the minus six, and I'm using a square root uh, enhancement, then the reading will be in the third decimal digit. So all of a sudden, we're gaining three orders. If it's of the, say, third order, and I use again 10 to the minus six, it's gonna be 10 to the minus two, I'm getting four orders. So this is what we're gonna be using later on for sensing. So uh, to demonstrate this effect, we make two micro cavities, uh, one with gain, one with loss, of course, being in a PT symmetric arrangement, they have the exceptional point anyway. And what they, because we have two cavities, the exceptional point is of order two, all right? And then we, are, we use electrical heaters to first balance them against the Kramers Cronin, all right? And then we use the same micro heaters to perturb them. So if you see, for example, this is how they look uh, from the top. 
And if you see, for example, the behavior, if, you, if this is the perturbation and this is the wavelength shift, you see here the square root behavior. And if you take the logarithm, you see the, uh, uh, the slope of one half, characteristic of the square root. So you see an enhancement here, a considerable enhancement, and especially the enhancement happens to be more profound here. The, uh, the smaller the, uh, the perturbation, the more the enhancement. If, on the other hand, we are dealing with an order three system, which is gain neutral loss, this has a third order exceptional point, all right? Then you get a cubic root, which is better shown over here. You see the slope is one third. And compared to a single cavity, uh, we get an enhancement of 25. Uh, until now, we are able to really boost it up to 75 and so on and so forth. So, uh, and what is very interesting is that you can see everything in the spectrum that it comes along. You see every eigenvalue is shown over here. You see these peaks. These peaks provide really these curves. So you can, from the amplitude and spacing, you can actually tell uh, how your system is responding in this particular fashion. For the particular arrangement over here, the exception point, what is interesting is that even though I'm putting the gain here, most of the energy resides in the central ring. It's again one of these counterintuitive, uh, counterintuitive things that come along because of the complex plane. Uh, on other applications, and this comes from uh, Young and Ostemis group from uh, Washington University. You see, uh, whenever you excite a micro ring using a, a, an external, uh, say, waveguide over here, uh, you trigger, of course, a mode that keeps going like this. But if by any chance, say, you have uh, a scatterer over here, then you may get also the other mode. And this, of course, this is not great in the sense that this provides standing waves. So if you are going to be doing nano detection of cell biomolecules and so on, if by any chance your target so happens to be in a minimum, uh, in a deep intensity, you're never going to really see it. You're never going to detect it. However, if you know what they're doing, you're going to introduce intentionally another scatter over here and then breaks the system at the exceptional point. And what happens? The clockwise and anticlockwise collapse on each other. And as a result, this interference pattern disappears. It's everywhere like this. Therefore, this whole ring can actually be used to detect. So you avoid really the, you know, the blackouts uh, for that matter. Of course, uh, what we are very much interested in is taking all this for uh, laser gyroscopes. Uh, there is always a problem over there, especially at very small rotations, as to how to detect this. And of course, we start, uh, to be honest with you, we have been going, we had an act ongoing activity to introduce uh, exceptional points in gyroscopes for enhancement of sensitivity to the Sanyak. Uh, we just ye learned yesterday that kind of, uh, you know, Vahala's group beat us, uh, you know, observe this in uh, SBS type uh, cavities. So he sees the square root behavior, the enhancement really in the Sanyak. For us, it's a bittersweet uh, news in the sense that yes, they uh, kind of uh, verified our earlier prediction, but then again, they beat us. So anyway, uh, we have to take it from there. But what I'm trying to say, bring this now little concepts. You see, the, what are exceptional points? Are just some mathematical curiosities that were in the books. But if you take them and you start using them cleverly, then maybe you can do things you couldn't do before. That's the whole idea. So it, it can actually boost technologies like uh, laser gyroscopes or say accelerometers and so on and so forth by just using these no-hermitian singularities. Uh, the next topic that we'll be discussing, and that will be the last topic, uh, will be faithful state conversion by encircling an exceptional point. So, you see, I was telling you before that an exceptional point position over here uh, makes the two Riemann sheets be intertwined. So, if by any chance, say, you try to encircle an exceptional point by varying, say, the gain, two parameters, like gain, detuning, and so on and so forth, you are actually taking the system along a right, you know, as shown over here. However, because this system now is not Hermitian, you may start from here, from this Riemann sheet, and you may end up on the bottom sheet. 
There is no such thing, for example, in the Hermitian system. Remember, the cones were totally separated. Even though you go around, it still remain on the, on, the, on the top or bottom cone. Here, you may start from the top and end up on the, you know, uh, on the lower level. So whenever you do that, you tend to exchange, really, uh, the eigenfunction from psi 1 to psi 2, psi 2 to minus psi 1, depending whether you go clockwise or anticlockwise. The things uh, become, and this is something that people observed before in microwaves and in condensates, exciton polarity system uh, uh, for that matter. But the system becomes more interesting when you do it dynamically. So if I have here an exceptional point, and this is the gain uh, uh, contrast over coupling, and then the, this is the detuning, then if I encircle it you know, in the clockwise direction, then I always get eigenstate one. If I encircle it the other way around, I always get eigenstate two. Irrespective of how I encircle it. I may encircle it in an ellipse, I may encircle. So essentially, this is anyone who took complex variables, whenever you encircle a pole, you always get two pi i, irrespective of the contour. Or if you go the other way around, you always get minus two pi i. So it's a very, very faithful and robust state conversion process as long as you really, uh, uh, you know, go around, say, uh, and this is something that was uh, uh, reported in two papers. Uh, uh, one was meant to be in optomechanics, and the other one was, uh, this is in optomechanics from Jack Harris group from Yale. Uh, the other one from uh, Vienna, uh, was done in microwaves and so on and so forth. So uh, what we would like to do is produce an omnipolarizer. In other words, uh, we'd like to, so if we have a device like this, and this is what we are building these days, if we have a device like this, any input polarization will be converted to X, and every input polarization from the other side of the device it will be converted, say, to Y, to the two orthogonal polarization, irrespective of the input. So um, anyway, this uh, it's uh, analysis and so on. I don't want to bother you with details. Uh, and of course, what we are doing quite recently is to take PT symmetry and non-hermedicity in topological photonics. Uh, so we are able really to, uh, by carefully uh, pumping really an S a so-called SSH uh, topological array, uh, we are able really to excite to see, uh, say, uh, S states uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, even more importantly, we used them very recently uh, to demonstrate for the first time lasing in topological arrays. So these are systems uh, produce acryo, tested acryo in collaboration with uh, our friends in Israel, uh, Motisa Gaves Group. So bottom line is you can see a unidirectional edge mode uh, state. So what is nice about these systems uh, uh, is the following. Even if a, a unit here malfunctions, uh, you know, the next one takes, uh, you know, takes over. So it, it's pretty good in case you have fabrication imperfections, you have malfunctions in the system, uh, 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 and so on and so forth. Anyway, by now, PT symmetry have permeated many other fields, uh, like, for example, topological photonics that I was telling you before. Definitely, there is a future in metrology. Uh, people are considering using uh, these non Hermitian concepts in metamaterials, plasmonics, nonlinear optics, uh, optomechanics. There's quite many papers in optomechanics for that matter. And quite recently, we were able, together with uh, our friends from China, to see uh, effects in atomic lattices. There is work in acoustics, even in wireless power transfer. This is work from Shanghui Fan's group uh, uh, concerning really wireless, uh, wireless power transfer uh, using uh, PT symmetry for that matter. And uh, given that I'm reaching, you know, it's almost five o'clock, I, I, I would like to thank you again all so much. Part of the refractive index the same in both gain and loss areas? 
Uh, yeah, mini, but then again, it gets affected because of Kramer's crony. That was my point. Yeah, but what matters is not really so much that this is like, you know, the same or whatever, it's the contrast between the two games. So sometimes we pump them differentially and still get the exceptional point. Mm. So we may keep one in transparency, the other one uh, a game. As long as you establish really the exceptional point, you are in, in good shape. Ken. Uh, you mean for sensing? Yes, well, uh, I mean, it can, I mean, these are st standard ideas, uh, mathematical ideas, and I'm sure you can use them even in acoustics if, if, if you want to, right? Uh, no, I mean, we have targeted so far uh, molecule sensing, and as I was telling you before, uh, RLG application. So this is the two directions we took. But I know many other groups really have different plans. It all depends what really fits them. Yeah, it depends where their background is, uh, for that matter. All right. Sure. I have a question. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So uh, I imagine that there must be some interesting optical choices. Yeah, we never went into that, yeah. Okay. But definitely, you see, you are absolutely correct. The S vector is, you know, it's skewed. Yes. So, so in spite of the fact that it's not an isotropic, it's just an isotropic material or anything of that right. sort. Yeah, we never went into these things. So there, there may be a problem. There may be issues, right? yeah. Okay. Yeah, there may be right. issues. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I remember what I wanted to ask you. All right. So it wasn't an exceptional point, but uh, when you push beyond getting the broken sensor, uh, has there uh, been anyone who's identified the reasons for that um, in pushing into the broken sensor? Yeah, many, well, many. Is it you see, than the pre exceptional point? Um, well, uh, actually, I mean, when Mercedes goes into, you know, single mode lasing, she is actually pushing the mode into that regime. That's why the winner takes it all. Uh, you see, she breaks the symmetry only for that longitudinal mode while it preserves it for the, uh, for the rest. So all the rest are not seeing the gain. They don't see the loss. They just stay where they're supposed to stay. But that fellow really shoots up and, and takes it all. So with a magnified gain. For the mother. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Got it? All right. If there are no more questions, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.